start for us to get going here. My name is Anthony Graham, and it's my privilege to serve on the CFAR's Board of Directors. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. In particular, I would like to welcome and recognize Her Honor, the Honorable Elizabeth Dodswell, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, who we're delighted to join us here this evening. And while you are all special guests in our minds, there's two in particular that I'd like to make special welcome and recognition of this evening. The Honorable Kirsty Duncan, Canada's Minister of Science. And the Honorable Rezi Moridi, Ontario's Minister of Research, Innovation, and Science. We are truly honored to have both of you here tonight. And at a time when science and the role of science is increasingly important, yet increasingly marginalized, we're honored as a province and as a nation to have ministers of science who are in fact scientists and are able to bring their scientific expertise to their portfolios. So welcome. Later this evening, we'll be hearing from three of our new CIFAR Azarelli Global Scholars. These are extraordinary researchers who are early in their careers, but who have already achieved important distinctions. For me, these young researchers exemplify what is great about CIFAR. Their work on an artificial intelligence, next generation energy, and the interplay of economics and culture tackles vitally important issues that require sustained interactions with a diverse network of distinguished peers. That's the advantage that CIFAR provides to our fellows. And to, today we need that advantage, that CIFAR advantage, more than ever before. The world faces complex problems that can't be resolved by any one researcher or any one country climate change, child welfare, and the genetics of disease. These are all problems that require a global and interdisciplinary approach. That's what CIFAR has been providing for over 35 years. CIFAR's global research networks connect the world's best minds across disciplines to tackle research questions of profound importance to humanity. It's an effort that I am proud to be part of. I thank all of you for being part of it too. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome our President and CEO, Dr. Alan Bernstein. Alan. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I'd also like to extend a welcome to uh, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowswell, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Uh, although the Lieutenant Governor doesn't have a speaking role, or maybe because she doesn't, uh, I think it's a measure of her sincere and deep interest in science that she's actually uh, uh, coming to, this is probably your third or fourth event at CIFAR, to actually hear science. So it's, it's great to have you here, Your Honor, and thank you very much for being here. And I also uh, like Tony, would like to uh, welcome the Honorable Kirsty Duncan, Minister of Science for Canada, and the Honorable Riza Maridi, uh, Ontario's Minister of Science, Research and Innovation, or Research, Science and Innovation. Uh, thank you both to, bo to both of you for being here. <clears throat> you know, those of us who are scientists, I think, feel we have a privileged life, because society's actually paying us to do what we like to do, um, and love to do, actually, and so I think it's a special a person who would choose to leave science and enter the political arena. And I think every Canadian, both in this province and across the country, is so grateful to, to both ministers of science who are here with us tonight, who have given up a sort of a blessed life in science to enter that other world. So thank you both very much on behalf of, of everybody. I, I'd also like to um, recognize many members of CIFAR's a great truly great board of directors who are here with us tonight. Um, our chair, Barb Stamietz, straight ahead of me. Uh, Tony Graham, who you've already heard from. Lindsay Gordon, Jill Wallette, Pat Meredith, Lawrence Paitlin, Brenda Eaton. Uh, and these are colleagues and board members from uh, across, across the country. Uh, you do uh, truly tremendous uh, work for CIFAR. Our board meeting earlier today, I think, was a great example of the wisdom and the dedication and, and commitment to CIFAR uh, that that we are also privileged to be able to take advantage of. Um, I also want to recognize CIFAR's honorable fellow, Richard Ivey, 
sitting straight ahead of me here. Richard uh, has been on the board of directors, sat on the board of directors for at least 20 years uh, and served as the, the chair for a number of years. And Richard, I think no one is more dedicated than you to this organization than Richard Ivey. Thank you very much, for Richard, for being here. Well, we all know Canada's 150 this year, uh, so we pale in comparison. We're 35, we being not me, but CIFAR. Uh, and I think it's really, uh, like any sort of birthday, it's a good time to look back and to look forward. And I think CIFAR certainly has many things to be proud of over its 35-year history. Uh, the Canada arm, many people don't know this. Um, I think George Fuerheller, one of the founding members of the board of directors of CIFAR will know this. The Canada arm had its origins uh, at CIAR, as it was called in those days. Uh, our deep understanding of child development and well-being, again, goes back to the 1980s and continues to this very day. Indeed, our program in child and brain development is meeting as we speak out in Vancouver. Uh, spectacular advances in artificial intelligence. Uh, if you read about it, you'll read about deep learning and AI, and it's not an understatement to say that it all had its origins in Canada and in CIFAR. Um, and you'll hear from one of its younger protagonists in a few moments. Uh, and they're all being led by fellows in our program in learning and machines and brains. I told the board today, the, the godfathers of uh, deep learning, as it's called, are Joshua Bengio from the University of Montreal, uh, Jan LeCun from, the University, from New York University and now Facebook, and Jeff Hinton from the University of Toronto. There's a company in, in England that will sell you a t-shirt, so I bought it. I forgot to bring it tonight. All it has on it is Joshua, Jeff, and Jan. There's no need to say any more. It's quite remarkable, actually. Um, I'm equally excited, of course, about CIFAR's future. Uh, I think the, the challenges that the world faces, the scientific opportunities that are now at our fingertips have never been greater than they are today. Uh, it's a wonderful time, I think, to be a scientist and to be a, the president of CIFAR. Uh, shortly after I started, we launched CIFAR 2.0. Uh, it builds on our strength in really catalyzing disruptive research. Uh, we are not in the business of incremental advances. We're kind of the, the risk capitalists of science. Um, we go for bold, complex, tough, but important questions. And the way we mitigate that risk is we bring together the very, very best minds on the planet that we can to come together to address the problem. And I think that's been our sort of secret sauce for the last 35 years and will certainly continue to be for the next 35. One of the key priorities that we recognized uh, under 2.0 <coughs> was the next generation of research leaders. And you will hear from three outstanding young people uh, in a moment. Uh, they are among the very first cohort of 18 scholars from five countries uh, that we appointed as the first CIFAR Azrieli Global Scholars. And th the motivation for that program was simple. Um, young people are the future. Um, they bring the intelligence, the enthusiasm, the naivete, uh, the uh, plasticity, neuronal plasticity uh, that you require to be a great scientist, and they're fearless. Uh, at the same time, it's never been harder to be a young scientist today. Funding is tight. Uh, demands on your time and on, on your intellect are coming at you every which way. You're learning how to mentor your first graduate students, how to change your first diaper, pay your first mortgage payment, teach your first course, write your first grant. It's hard. Uh, so the, the, the Azraeli Global Scholars Program was really designed to give a kickstart to people who we think at least are outstanding and show outstanding promise. We're very fortunate that the Azraeli Foundation um, decided that they agreed that this was an important thing to do and have come with us as partners and visionary donors recognizing uh, the importance of young people. And I know that Naomi Azraeli is uh, here with her this evening and her, her and her foundation have really been just tremendous partners and friends to work with. So Naomi, it's great to see you here. That, that program gives at least three or four things to young people. First, um, they become attached to the program that most fits their own scientific interests. And so, like the MasterCard uh, ad says, that's priceless, because they get to interact with the world's top 20 or 30 scientists in their own field on a regular basis for two or three years. 
Second, they get mentored by a senior individual in the field, not necessarily from their own country even, but someone who has a clear interest in mentoring them. Um, third, they get money. They get $100,000 of unrestricted research money for the two years they're an Israeli global scholar. And fourth, we're putting together a leadership experience where these young emerging research leaders will be exposed to each other, whether they're a physicist, an economist, a mathematician, a geneticist, what have you, and they'll be exposed to uh, leadership leaders in society um, uh, who will talk with them about what does it mean to be a leader? Um, not necessarily in science or research, but across society. So we're very excited about this program. I think the people we've identified so far are just incredible, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what happens with this. Um, and of course, CIFAR fellows, uh, all close to 400 from 18 countries, continue to demonstrate the very highest level of excellence that one can possibly imagine. Uh, we have, over the last year, our fellows have collected about 70 of the world's highest awards. And uh, by highest, I mean highest. Uh, Art McDonald, who, uh, the great Canadian physicist who won the Nobel Prize uh, last year uh, in, in October, is a CIFAR fellow. Uh, and, and on it goes. Um, on Monday, uh, the Erasmus Prize, which is a major prize given by the King of the Netherlands, uh, will be announced and it will be going to a CIFAR fellow, a, a social scientist. Uh, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you who it is because it hasn't been announced yet, but it's a very prestigious award uh, in the social sciences, probably the major award in the social sciences. Um, and the Kavli Prize, etc., the Nobel, the Kavli, the Erasmus, the BBVA Prize went to Jeff Hinton for artificial intelligence, and, and on it goes. I've said this to my wife, but if we were a university, uh, and I apologize to representatives from various universities who I know are here, who I know are here, we would be by far the best university on the planet. So my wife said, well, yeah, you cherry pick. <laughs> so of course you're the best, but Harvard cherry picks and MIT cherry picks and U of T cherry picks, but CIFAR cherry picks the best. Uh, just one example, actually. Um, I think there's been about seven companions of the Order of Canada announced in the last two years. The companion, of course, as many of you will know, is the very highest honor uh, that our nation can bestow on a civilian. It's a member of the officer, it's, it's a member of the Order of Canada, and it's the highest order. Four of that seven are CIFAR fellows. Brenda Andrews, Janet Rosant, Vicki Caspi, and Art McDonald. It's quite a remarkable uh, statistic, and actually none of us, as far as I know, had anything to do with it other than these four great uh, scientists who have been honored uh, in such a deep way. Uh, our 14 programs continue to make huge progress. I'm not going to go into any detail on that, but uh, I recommend you look at our website, and if you have any questions, please come and see me or anybody uh, on our staff uh, to ask them about it. Finally, I'd like to mention a very exciting project for CIFAR. We're going to Mars. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> uh, March the 6th is our moving date. We move out March the 3rd, we move in March the 6th. Uh, we're very excited about that. It's um, uh, the new headquarters. We will be surrounded by many colleagues who are interested in research and innovation. Uh, I think it's a great uh, move for this organization and it, we're very, all very excited about it. Uh, and uh, we'll be there, we'll be having a pizza party if you want to help us unpack on Monday, March the 6th. You're all invited. Um, so also, finally, I want to thank everybody uh, in this room for your support for CIFAR. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Uh, it's essential to do the work that we do. Uh, we think we, we use your, your support very wisely uh, in picking the very best people and choosing the very best problems, the most complex and important problems that we can find. I now would like to introduce our next speaker, Minister Kirsty Duncan. As Tony mentioned earlier, we are very lucky to have two ministers of science who are both scientists. They understand the culture of science, the importance of science, the pace of science, the, the, the challenges of being a scientist. And I think that um, empathy and that understanding means so much to the scientific community um, and it means so much, I think, to this country. Um, and so uh, on behalf of all of us at CIFAR, thank you, Kirsty, and, and you, Minister Maridi, for taking this on. Um, uh, Minister Duncan, Canada's Minister of Science, was an Associate Professor of Health Studies 
at the University of Just, I'm going to continue at the University of Toronto. She was the former research director for the AIC Institute of Corporate Citizenship at the Rotman School of Management. She's a renowned international speaker. She represented Canada on the uh, International Climate Change Commission. Uh, she's lectured for many organizations, including the National Geographic Society, the Government of Japan, and the Young President's Organization. She has a PhD in Geography from the University of Edinburgh. Please join me in welcoming Minister Duncan, Canada's <laughs> Minister of Science. Good evening, everyone. And Alan, thank you for your kind words. Thank you for inviting me to this prestigious event. And I would like to acknowledge your enormous contributions to science, your lifetime of service to science and to this country. I'd like to also to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of several Indigenous nations, and I'd like to recognize the long history and contributions of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in Ontario. I'd like to extend warm greetings to our distinguished guests who join us tonight, of course, our Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, Reza Moridi, Ontario's Minister of Research, Innovation, and Science, members of the Azrieli family. His foundation's generous support for CIFAR helps many global scholars. And to everyone from the scientific community here to our distinguished guests, thank you for supporting CIFAR. I don't have to tell you, for more than 30 years, CIFAR has brought together extraordinary, and I mean extraordinary researchers from across Canada and around the world to address questions of global importance. We are proud to support their work and the broad international reach of this organization. Again, let me express how grateful I am for the work of CIFAR. To all of you, we value science. We respect scientists and the important work you do each and every day. And we believe making decisions based on evidence is a Canadian value and one that we will continue to promote. We also want to, as Alan mentioned, it's hard for young researchers right now. And we want young researchers to be able to have nights like these and to be able to have their research dreams. So which brings me the reason why we're here tonight, to recognize the outstanding global scholars. So I would just like to take a minute or two to pay tribute to three early career researchers being supported by CIFAR and the Azrieli Foundation through the Global Scholars Program. Dr. Natalie Bao, who's based at the University of Toronto. She's a social scientist. She's an economist engaged in CIFAR's institutions, organizations, and growth research program. And she's looking at inequities among countries. Dr. Gabriella, Gabriella Schlau-Cohen, who is a researcher from MIT and who's arrived tonight to be here. And she's part of CIFAR's Bio-Inspired Solar Energy Program. And this program aims at understanding the biological mechanisms used by plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria to harvest light, and then apply those strategies to improve solar power technology. And then we'll hear from Dr. Graham Taylor, who's based at the University of Guelph. And as Alan has said, uh, Dr. Taylor is part of Learning in Machines in the Brain Research Program. All three of 
the people we will have the privilege of listening to are remarkable early career researchers. And I think we should all take a minute to recognize them. <laughs> to the three global scholars, you inspire us all. On behalf of the Government of Canada, I want to thank you for your commitment to science, to serving the public good. Congratulations on being part of the inaugural cohort of the CIFAR Azraeli Global Scholars. We wish you the best of luck, and I know all of us will be looking forward to learning about your research. To all of you gathered, Thank you for the work you do. To CIFAR, thank you for bringing the world together. Merci, congratulations. Thank you very much, Minister Duncan. It's now my pleasure and honor to introduce Minister Meridi. The Honourable Minister Meridi is Ontario's Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. He was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2007 as the MPP for Richmond Hill and has been re-elected twice in 2011 and 2014. Prior to his current role, he was Minister of Research and Innovation as well as the Minister for Training, Colleges and Universities. Minister Meridi is a graduate of Tehran University in, in Iran and he earned his PhD from Brunel University in London, UK. He was elected a fellow of the Institute of Physics and admitted as a fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology of the United Kingdom. Prior to entering into politics, he had a 17-year career at the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada, where he was the Vice President and Chief Scientist. Please join me in welcoming Minister Moridi. Thank you, Alim, for that very kind and gracious introduction. I must make a little uh, um, editorial that I am not anymore a double minister. I used to be double minister, minister for research and innovation and the minister for training colleges and universities, but uh, after the cabinet shuffle in June, I said to a premier that you are paying me one salary, I am running two ministries. <coughs> minister of Labour will uh, object to that. So. Uh, now I'm only Minister for uh, Research Innovation and they added the word science to it as well. So it's a great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to be here and your honor, Minister Duncan, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking everyone at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research for the outstanding work that you do every day. You have an impressive track record. CIFAR supports researchers at over 130 institutions worldwide, including 83 people from 11 organizations in our province of Ontario. And the 18 Nobel Prize winners have received CIFAR support, including our own Dr. Arthur MacDonald, the 2015 Nobel Prize winner in physics, for showing that neutrinos, those little tiny particles, they have a mass. This was one of the questions I was asked when I was doing one of my master's degree in nuclear physics about uh, something called the beta decay. Uh, this was a very interesting scientific story that um, people couldn't explain the beta decay, meaning that radioactive materials fires a particle called beta particles. But this phenomena actually broke down two major conservation laws of physics. One was conservation of energy, and the other one was conservation of mass. And there was a very uh, imaginative scientist. He said, there must be something there which we don't see it. It must be very little, tiny. So they called it neutrino, and nobody knew what these neutrinos are until Art um, uh, he basically showed that these neutrinos, they have really mass. And by the way, Art MacDonald, I mentioned to him, I said, Art, you have to win another Nobel Prize for us. One is not enough. So he said he's working on dark matter. 
and hopefully if we can get to something breakthrough, uh, we will have another Nobel Prize in the near future uh, for our country, Canada. CIFAR brings together some of the world's best research scientists and minds, people who can spark groundbreaking ideas. And your groundbreaking work in artificial intelligence, as you already hear, is setting Canada as a global, uh, global leader in that uh, area. I was at, the, um, at Northern California just last week and visiting the University of California at Berkeley. And as many of you in this room will know that there are two major centers for artificial intelligence in North America. One is, of course, University of California at Berkeley and the other one, University of Toronto. The contributions CIFAR is making are fostering Ontario's research and innovation ecosystem. And of course, you are inspiring young leaders as well. I look forward to hearing from three of these young leaders later this evening. As researchers, we often face tough challenges with serious implications. For example, a child depends on you to help their parents survive a deadly disease like cancer. And in Ontario, as you know, we are one of the leaders in cancer research. Ontario Institute for Cancer Research is one of the leaders in North America, at least. People around the world look for you, for researchers to answer, to meet future energy needs and combat the effects of global warming, which as we know, it is real. And we know these challenges demand research and critical thinking. World-renowned physicist Stephen Hawking, who has a special relationship with our Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, including a center there that is named after him, once said, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. So ladies and gentlemen, we need new ways of thinking to address today's challenges. We need exceptional minds like yours, working together to make that transformative discoveries. And that's why Government of Ontario is proud to support the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Our investment supports global research networks working on a number of Ontario's priority areas, including artificial intelligence, as you heard, quantum computing, which is going to take us to the next level in, in computer engineering. We will move from, actually we have moved from analog electronics to digital electronics in 1945, 1948, sorry, by the invention of transistor. Now we have been in digital electronics and we'll be moving towards, uh, uh, towards computer, uh, sorry, quantum computing or quantum electronics, maybe in five to 10 years, I've been told and indeed a uh, life sciences sector as well. So facilitating uh, global connections here in Ontario is vital for your research as well as for our province's future as we move very fast in building our knowledge-based economy. And that is the way our country and our province can compete around the world in terms of economic growth. We cannot rely on traditional manufacturing, uh, knowledge-based manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and knowledge-based economy is the way to go. And the engine behind knowledge-based economy is science, is scientific thinking, scientific uh, work and research innovation. These are the things which we have great talents in our uh, country and our province. Collaboration, ladies and gentlemen, raises in our international profile around the world. And the most importantly, it leads to life-changing breakthroughs that extend beyond our borders. And that's why CIFAR has been doing for a number of years since its inception in 1982. For example, finding new ways to make sure when a child turns on tap, clean drinking water flows. Now researchers from the province of Ontario and China are working together to solve that very problem for China. The South to North Water Diversion Project in China is helping accelerate the use of Ontario-based water treatment technologies in that country. And it is helping 
to provide safe drinking water for people of China, including Beijing, their capital city. We want to support more great collaboration of this nature. And that's why we will continue to strengthen our international relationship to fund agreements with other countries, including Germany, Israel, India, and of course, China and other countries. Our government also knows that how important it is to help early career researchers right here at home. And that's why we have awarded more than 900 early researcher awards over the last decade, including one to Dr. Michael Timiansky. Michael is a neurosurgeon at the University Health Network, and he did something researchers thought was impossible. He invented a drug that limits brain damage from a stroke. And the drug could potentially be used to treat people with Alzheimer's diseases, which could help a lot of families right here in our province of Ontario and our country, Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Ontario has so much to offer to the world. A talented workforce, innovative companies, and a world-class innovation ecosystem. We need to tell our story to the, to the world so we can open up further opportunities for our researchers and for our businesses and ultimately create more good jobs here in our province of Ontario. I was, as I said, in Silicon Valley in Northern California just last week and uh, uh, I noticed there that doing business in Silicon Valley is becoming more and more expensive. And we have in Ontario, I mean, Ottawa, Toronto, Waterloo Corridor is equivalent to Silicon Valley in terms of talents. There are 250,000 Ontario graduates in science and engineering are working in Silicon Valley. And we do have a Silicon Valley here, and I think now people are looking at Ontario to bring their research uh, companies here to, to conduct research in Ontario. And we need to just to tell our stories. And her honor is doing her best in terms of telling Ontario stories to the world. And we all need to follow her path so that people around the world will uh, know we are here and that we have that talent in Ontario so that uh, uh, we, can, we can succeed. And I think that is the way to go for our province of Ontario. And uh, uh, just in closing, I want to thank Alan yourself and your colleagues and the board members and the institute as a whole for the great work you do and the great profile you bring to our country, Canada, by the work you do internationally in terms of bringing those, uh, the networking and the connecting the top minds in the world, which as a result of their work, not only we benefit in Ontario and Canada, but seven billion human beings on our bigger country called planet Earth, we all benefit from the work the scientists they do and the work you facilitate, uh, which they can carry on. So thank you very much, merci beaucoup. Thank you. To introduce our three uh, young Azraeli global scholars, I'm going to introduce John Hepburn. So we're going to have a chain, a cascade of, chain of introductions here. Uh, John Hepburn is uh, CIFAR's VP Research. Uh, he assumed uh, that position almost a year ago last June, after we had conducted a very long and exhaustive uh, search. Uh, I must say he's already providing great and strong leadership both within the organization as an ambassador for the organization on the outside, and I feel especially lucky to have a, a great colleague in John Hepburn. Uh, he comes to us from the University of British Columbia, where he was the VP of research uh, for a very long time. I think he survived three or four university presidents. They came, the same one twice. Yeah. Uh, uh, and before that, he was the professor in the departments of chemistry, physics, and astronomy. He's a PhD in, in chemistry from the University of Toronto completed his undergraduate chemis chemistry degree at the University of Waterloo, and he has uh, many honors to his name. I'll just name a couple. He has a Rutherford Medal in Physics from the Royal Society of Canada, elected fellowships in the American Physical Society and the Chemical Institute of Canada, and an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation 
Fellowship. He's one of the few people who can say he trained with two Nobel laureates. Please join me in welcoming John Hepburn. Thank you very much, Alan, and good evening, everyone. Now for what you've all been really waiting for, as wonderful as the food has been. Um, we're going to hear from three of our first cohort of Azrieli Global Scholars. And this is a new program for CIFAR, and, and actually, truth be told, and, and Dick, cover your ears, this is my favorite program at CIFAR, but uh, you know, Cosmology and Gravity is close second. It's a wonderful partnership with the Azrieli Foundation, which is how we got into this business. And uh, really, it's, as Alan told us earlier, it's, it's part of our commitment to helping nurture the next generation of research leaders. And for this program, uh, the idea is to choose an international cohort of exceptional early career investigators who are looking for a chance to think differently about research. So not only are they exceptionally good in their own disciplines of research, but they're interested in other disciplines of research. That's really what we're looking for. And so they will become the next generation of research leaders. I've had the pleasure of seeing many of these global scholars at our program meetings because, of course, as Alan said, that's one of the benefits. They join a research program. And if you want to be intimidated by very smart young people, um, you should meet them and talk to them. They're frighteningly intelligent and good. Um, in addition to the three scholars uh, you'll hear from tonight, I'd like to point out uh, there's a few locals. Alan said the global scholars are from 18 scholars from five different countries, so we couldn't afford to bring them all together tonight, and they're all, in fact, I met two of them in Vancouver at the program meeting Alan referred to uh, yesterday. But there are two here from the University of Toronto, and so uh, we should recognize them too. Lu Yi Yang, there's Lu Yi, she's in the Quantum Materials program. And uh, Miko Taipale, who's in Molecular Architecture of Life. Uh, Miko, where are you hiding? There he is. But now, for the main event, they're both assistant professors here at the University of Toronto and off to what will be fantastically successful careers. Now, our first speaker tonight uh, is Gabriella Schlau-Cohen. Dr. Schlau-Cohen is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, her research group uses single molecule spectroscopy and ultrafast laser spectroscopy, and don't worry, she's going to tell you what she means, but uh, there will be a test afterwards. You have to define what a femtosecond is in the question and answer period. These tools, state-of-the-art tools, provide a detailed molecular level picture of how biological systems work, and of course she's in the bio-inspired solar energy program. So her group focuses on investigating photosynthetic light harvesting. She's a recipient of a Beckman Young Investigator Award and the Smith Family Award for Excellence in Biomedical Research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schlau Cohen. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about how the biggest problem facing our society was solved three and a half billion years ago by bacteria. So the biggest problem we're facing is climate change. The rise in CO2 shown on these plots and the associated climate impacts are sending us on a path to destruction. And this means we need dramatic changes in our energy usage and changes in our energy sources. When we think about renewable energy sources, solar energy is a particularly attractive option. And that's because in just one hour of sunlight, there's more energy incident on the Earth's surface from the sun than is consumed by humans over an entire year. And so when we're thinking about technology for the next five, maybe the next 10 years, silicon photovoltaics, like the pictures that we see here, these are the technology that we'll use. But when we want to think further than that, when we want to think 20, 50 years down the road, what we want is a solar energy technology that doesn't have the limitations of silicon photovoltaics. Specifically, silicon photovoltaics don't have high power density, meaning they're not good at capturing sunlight, which is relatively dilute, and concentrating it to a strong power source that we need to drive our machinery. Also, 
there's an issue of reliability. We can see that on the picture of the Earth's surface. There are clouds, and the more clouds, the less energy from your solar panels. But these problems have been solved. They've been solved by evolution. So photosynthetic systems, like photosynthetic, like plants and photosynthetic bacteria, have solved issues like reliability. And so we want to know, can we understand how they work? And from that understanding, pull out key principles that will allow us to develop the next generation of solar energy sources. So the major idea behind how they solve this problem is the same idea that we saw in the recent Star Wars movie, Rogue One. So it's the idea of an antenna dish. The climax of this movie, for those who haven't seen it, was all about this antenna dish that can concentrate information and transmit high information to sh high density information to ships in space. In this case, it was the plans for the Death Star. But photosynthetic systems, they use the same kind of concept, where they have an antenna to concentrate solar energy. And for photosynthetic systems, this antenna dish is actually dynamic. It's smaller under sunny day conditions, and it gets bigger under cloudy day conditions. So it depends on what the environment is like. Now, this is a key difference between how biological systems work and how most devices that we manufacture work. Devices we manufacture are usually manufactured to a spec. They perform to that spec, maybe degrade gradually. Biological systems are dynamic. They're constantly changing and reorganizing in response to their environment. And so this is one place where we see that kind of idea work to their advantage. So for photosynthetic systems, the antenna dish is actually made of proteins. So here's our molecular model of what this antenna dish looks like. So it's similar for plants. Here I'm showing you the version for photosynthetic bacteria. Here's the model of this protein network. We can think about it using a simpler picture. And essentially, what happens is there's absorption of sunlight, and then that absorbed energy migrates through this network to a central location where electricity is generated. So the trajectory that I'm showing here, this is just one of many, many possible trajectories. So sunlight that's absorbed throughout this antenna dish is concentrated to generate electricity at high power densities. We want to know how does nanoscale organization of this protein antenna drive this process, which is known as light harvesting. We want to know what are the properties of these individual proteins and how are they organized to create this functional antenna dish. So when we're thinking about this, the key idea is identifying what are the time scales and mechanisms behind this energy flow. Time scales is the key parameter in identifying what this process looks like, and it also gives us insight into the mechanism or how it works. So this energy flow that I show here is actually a series of energy transfer steps. So it's this series of incredibly fast energy transfer steps, and we want to understand each one of them. But how do we do that? How do we look at something so fast? Well, we do that with ultra-fast lasers. So this is a picture of the ultra-fast laser system in my lab at MIT. And what ultra-fast lasers do is they actually allow us to look at a process that's a millionth of a billionth of a second long. That's a femtosecond for those of you who are taking notes for the test that John told you is going to come later. So how our apparatus works is we have two of these laser pulses that hit our sample. The first one, it's like the sun. It excites it. And then the second laser pulse is like our camera, so it checks in to see what's going on. And in this way, we're able to look at energy transfer processes on this incredibly short time scale. 
And that's the technology that we use to look at something so fast. But how do we zoom in inside a cell and look at this energy transfer process inside a bacteria? Well, we do that by actually building up piecewise this protein network that forms the antenna dish. So in my lab, we build it where we take a membrane and we embed within it these individual proteins. In this way, by building it up piecewise, we can actually look at these two key ideas, the properties of the protein and the properties of the organization. And so in one recent result, we looked at energy transfer in this kind of system, and we compared the energy transfer rates in these isolated proteins. And we found that certain important steps in that energy flow are 30% faster in this membrane environment. And so what that tells us is what surrounds the proteins is an important knob that biological systems can tune that allows them to control this efficient light harvesting. And so this is one idea that we've learned from photosynthesis about one knob that allows us to get increased power from light harvesting. And that kind of idea is something that can now be applied to devices. We can think about ways we can concentrate sunlight using similar knobs to increase the efficacy of the solar cells. But equally important is then, as we're improving the devices, going back to the fundamental science, thinking more deeply about how photosynthesis works and the kind of basic principles at play there so we can continue to use fundamental science to improve devices. Now, this idea of learning from nature is not new. Humanity has always been inspired by nature. We saw birds and we built a plane. That's how I got here today. But what's new is we can now look down at the nanoscale. And with that new power, we can use how the, some of the world's tiniest organisms work to solve our biggest problems. Gabriella. Uh, they've got to pass over the controller here. So next we're going to hear from Natalie Bao, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics here at the University of Toronto. Her research explores the interaction between cultural norms, economic behavior, and development policies. Amongst other things, her work examines the role school building plays in female educational achievements and how changes in pension plans can affect educational investments differently depending on cultural norms. Her work shows how policies can have unintended consequences and underlines the importance of understanding how individual reactions to policies based on cultural norms will affect how policy initiatives will affect growth. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bao. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Natalie Bao, and today I'd like to tell you about the economics of culture. Until recently, both economists and policymakers have neglected the important role that culture plays in determining the effects of different world scale development policies. We believe that some development policies, like pension plan expansions or school construction programs, are good and that they should be implemented everywhere in pretty much the same way. However, this is starting to change. In 2015, the World Bank, not typically the most radical organization, and I should know as a former World Bank employee, released an annual development report called Mind, Society, and Behavior. This report highlighted the importance of cultural context for determining the effects of different development policies. It said that policy making should not be one size fits all. To show you that if we neglect the important role that culture plays, we will get it wrong and will fail to understand the effects of different policies, I'd like to talk to you about two examples from my own work. While the title of this slide, The Cultural Causes of Everything, might be a slight overstatement, hopefully I'll at least convince you that even if culture doesn't cause everything, 
it's still incredibly important. First, I'll tell you about a cultural norm called Blyde Price. And I'll show you that this cultural norm leads some girls to benefit from world school construction programs in Indonesia and Zambia, while others do not. I'll then talk to you about another set of cultural norms that determine which children support parents in their old age. And I'll show you that actually pension plans can have very strong negative unintended consequences in some cultural contexts, actually reducing education among some ethnic groups in Indonesia and Ghana. In both cases, we'll see that cultural context is important for determining the effects of different development policies on female education. Since the education of girls is important to both take girls out of po poverty in low-income countries and also bring their families out of poverty, as this quotation by Hillary Clinton illustrates, understanding the crucial effect of cultural context is important for thinking about policies that close gender gaps and help girls succeed in school. So, without further ado, let me tell you about Bride Place. Bride Place is a cultural tradition where the groom makes a payment to the parents of the bride at the time of marriage. In many countries, particularly in Africa, Bride Places are traditionally paid in cows. However, today, Bride Places are more commonly paid in cash. And in fact, Bride Places are such a big part of the cultural ethos that you can find Bride Place calculators like this Blyde Price app from Nigeria. Here I've inputted my details, somewhat over-exaggerating my cooking skills, and I've discovered that as a premium babe, I will into a Blyde Price of 550,000. While this tradition might seem unfamiliar to us, it's actually quite common in much of the world. Here I've put up a map that I've stolen from Ethnomaps, you see countries in red are countries where bride price is traditionally the predominant custom. You can see that in much of sub-Saharan Africa, bride price is very common. And this is also the case in parts of Indonesia. Even though bride price is very widespread, many activists view it as a repugnant uh, tradition. They think that it's similar to buying and selling women. And there's even been calls to ban bride price in Uganda and Kenya. Despite these potential negative aspects of Blyde Place norms, Blyde Place also has an interesting, potentially positive aspect. It turns out that Blyde Place amounts increase with female education. This is so well known that when we began work on Blyde Place and we went to Lusaka, Zambia, and we interviewed Blyde Place negotiators, they told us about this positive relationship between Blyde Place amounts and female education. And so this is a quote by a Blyde Price negotiator who tells us that Blyde Price amounts increase with female education because an educated girl brings value to her husband's family. Of course, we don't just have to take the Blyde Price negotiator's word for this. We can also collect data on Blyde Price amounts and match it to female education and see if, in fact, Blyde Price amounts do increase with female education. So here I've estimated the returns to education for Blyde Place in Indonesia and Zambia. The y-axis here are in percents. And you can see that for a girl in Indonesia, moving from no education to attending junior secondary school more than doubles her Blyde Place. Attending college doubles her Blyde Place again. And we see the same strong positive relationship between female education and Blyde Place in Zambia as in Indonesia. So if bride price amounts increase with education, it's possible that the bride price custom incentivizes parents to educate their daughters. To see if this is the case, along with my co-authors, Nava Ashraf, Nathan Nunn, and Alessandro Vuina, I studied the effect of world-scale school construction programs in Indonesia and Zambia. In both countries, we found a striking result. Among ethnic groups, that had a, tr a tradition of paying high bride prices, when access to schools increased, female education also increased. However, among ethnic groups that didn't have these high bride price traditions, the school construction program had no effect on female education. And so surprisingly, 
If you simply wanted to maximize female education through the school construction program, you would want to build schools in the areas with a lot of ethnic groups with traditionally high buy prices. So what does this teach us? Well, first, culture is crucial for the design of large-scale policies and also for the evaluation of large-scale policies. Because here, the school construction program had very different effects depending on different groups' ethnic norms. Additionally, banning a cultural norm like bride price, despite its potential negative effects, could have a downside. It could reduce female education. And therefore, if we were to ban bride price, we might want to also subsidize female education. And finally, even though cultural context is crucial for designing policy, we can still learn from one country to think about policy in a very different country. Here we can learn lessons from Muslim Indonesia for predominantly Christian Zambia. Okay, so cultural norms don't just interact with different policies, they can also have negative unintended consequences. To show you how this can happen, let me tell you about another piece of my research focusing on the cultural norms of match locality and patch locality. In my research, I hypothesized that match locality incentivizes parents to educate their daughters. This is because daughters take care of their parents in their old age, and therefore educating a daughter is a way for parents to save for retirement. Similarly, I hypothesized that patch locality incentivizes parents in low-income countries to educate their sons. It turns out that this is exactly the case. If we look across countries, in countries where a higher percentage of citizens are traditionally patch or local, there's larger gender gaps in education between men and women. In fact, patch locality explains about 5% of the global gender gap. So what happens when you institute a pension plan which gives parents an alternative way of saving instead of educating their children? Well, it turns out that these pension plans can actually reduce education. In Indonesia, when you introduce a pension plan, matrilocal daughters finish less schooling. And in Ghana, when you introduce a pension plan, patrilocal sons also finish less schooling. Now, clearly, this was not the intention of the designers of the pension plans. They had just hoped to increase welfare. They could have never imagined that the cultural context in Indonesia would lead them to reduce female education among some ethnic groups. So yet again, we see that culture is crucial for crafting successful policies, and that policymaking should not be one size fits all. In fact, even the most well-intentioned policies can have negative unintended consequences when we fail to consider the cultural context. However, economics can offer us with tools to try and understand how cultural norms will interact with different policies and try and predict how the effects of policies in new contexts. So a growing group of researchers are now thinking about and generating knowledge about the interactions between different cultural norms and policies. It's our hope that eventually this research will influence the actions of different development agencies like my former employer, the World Bank. If you'd like to learn more about my research, I put up my email address here for you. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Our next very eager speaker is Graham Taylor. Now, Graham is an assistant professor in the School of Engineering at the University of Guelph where he leads the machine learning research group, and I'm sure by now all of you have read about machine learning, the next big thing in artificial intelligence. His research focuses on statistical machine learning with an emphasis on deep learning and sequential data. Much of his work is focused on seeing people in images and video. He has received recently a very competitive uh, Canada-France strategic partnership grant, and he's also the academic director of Next AI, a nonprofit initiative to establish Canada as the AI hub for research, venture creation, and technology commercialization. And now, join me in welcoming Dr. Taylor.
One Saturday morning, I set off with my two-year-old son, Glenn, to the Halton County Rail Museum, which is about 20 minutes from Guelph. So I got out my phone, pulled up Google Maps, entered our destination into it, and we set off. And about a minute into our drive, my phone started talking to me. It said that our destination would be closed by the time we got there, and so we headed back. Now, this is very simple, but it was actually, for me as an AI researcher, a life-changing moment. I realized how much AI was embedded into my life. Today, I'm going to take you through a cascade of changes, from a navigation app, to an itinerary planner, to self-driving cars, and finally to virtual reality experiences generated by AI where you don't even need to leave your house. I'm going to talk about what happens when AI moves from prediction to creation. Now, of course, this might conjure up terrifying images of HAL 9000 from 2001 or Skynet from the Terminator series. And of course, in popular culture, this is a legitimate concern. But my goal for you is to become an informed contributor to the dialogue on how we might interact with a world of smart machines. But first, let me take you into my lab and tell you a little bit about what we do. That's not my lab. This is my lab. <laughs> so we focus on three elements, all of which are connected by deep learning. Algorithms, applications, and acceleration. So first, let's talk about algorithms and architectures. Machine learning is all about transforming inputs, which come in the form of data, to useful outputs like predictions, visualizations, and decisions. I tend to like to think of it as a computer program. So I could write a computer program to square a number. And I could write a computer program to read in a series of chords and output a melody. But some computer programs are really, really tough for humans to write. Just think about writing a program to drive a car. Even if you were a spectacular programmer, that would be very difficult to do. And the best way to write such a program is to learn from experience. That's the amazing thing about machine learning. We can learn these really complicated programs without any human programmer, programmer in the loop. All we need is data, an architecture, and a learning algorithm. So let's talk about architectures. Architectures are the mapping from input to output. And deep learning, an area that has emerged with Canada as a leader, in part due to CIFAR's support, is all about inspiration from the brain, de defining multiple layers of representation to go from input to output. But architecture alone is not enough. These structures have tens or hundreds of millions of parameters that must be fit some way. And this is the automatic pro programming that takes place. So the way this happens is typically through the use of pairs of inputs and outputs and a trial and error process where the predictions are gradually driven towards better and better solutions. And there's no single best learn learning algorithm or architecture. For now, it's largely the result of human ingenuity. But it will be a major inflection point when machines learn how to learn. Second, we have applications. And my group tends to focus on something called computer vision, which is about teaching computers to see just like humans. Because people are the dominant subject in nearly all images and videos, we tend to have our vision centered on them. And this leads to applications like person detection, identification, activity recognition, and emotion recognition. However, being at the University of Guelph, Canada's food university, has allowed us to apply computer vision to challenging problems in agri-food. So I've worked with collaborators in plant agriculture and environmental science to 
generate smart traps that can automatically detect insect pests that are destroying orchards, and also build drone solutions that can monitor cover crops that re restore nitrogen to soil. I'd like to mention that I'd like you also to uh, envision a drone flying across the stage. We had brought one here today, and after we crashed it two times during rehearsal, <laughs> they told us, no way, no drones in this room. So just use your imagination. So in an era of increased population and climate change, we're working together with Guelph's Food Institute to work towards machine learning algorithms that can assist the sustainable growth, production, and consumption of food. Now the third and final A is acceleration. Machine learning is computationally intensive. And that's why we're actively working towards systems that can learn faster and with reduced power. Part of deep learning success is a result of these things here called graphics processing units. These are specialized computer architectures that have thousands of cores. And the interesting thing is that they were repurposed from hardcore gamers. They have been the dominant mode of computation for the last 10 years, while machine learning has largely existed in the cloud. And you've probably interacted with these systems on a daily basis when you do an internet search, or you receive an Amazon or Netflix recommendation, or you use face recognition in a Photos app. But there's always been a gap. There's the internet between you and the system. In other words, you've never really met the machine. But as machine learning moves from the cloud to the physical world, the computational demands won't diminish, but power consumption must. So the drone that flies over the field and not only detects weeds, but takes action on them, or the human, humanoid robot in your home that's folding your laundry and unloading your dishwasher, they're not going to be so useful if they constantly need to recharge. And that's why our group is working on ways to develop learning algorithms that can run at 10 to 100 times less power on specialized architectures. Now, the systems I've talked about so far are largely prediction machines. They produce simple outputs. But the world is moving towards machines that create art, music, dialogue, prose. A central problem with predictive machines and creative, sorry, creative machines is that machine learning requires an objective function. And this is typically based on minimizing error. For these simple predictive systems, minimizing error is pretty simple. You just try to match the prediction against some desired output. But when it comes to machines that create, how are we supposed to measure the quality of their outputs? A major problem here is the fact that there's often no single right answer. I'd like to draw your attention here to something called Google Inbox. I receive about 100 emails a day. And this AI-based application will read my emails, suggest three replies, and I can simply click on a button. Okay? It's really quite amazing. And I, I am a bit embarrassed to say it, but I use it for about 5% of my emails. And as I use it, it will continue to get better. So this kind of human-in-the-loop style AI is where I see us as humans coexisting with machines for quite some time. It makes the creation and I perform the judgment. Another problem with these creative machines is the fact that their output is very structured. It's very complex. So if you take something simple like, again, visual recognition. I show an image to an algorithm. I ask it, what is that image? This is just a standard computer vision recognition problem. The output is just a category. But if I ask an AI to make me a meal, suddenly the output is much more structured and complex. And this is just talking about getting the recipe straight. If the machine's actually working on taking physical action in the world, this gets much, much more complicated. So in conclusion, the early stages of creative machines have actually resulted in auto-generated art, poetry, and music. So this is actually an AI-generated tune, and it's kind of catchy. 
So when I talk about Google Inbox or machine translation systems or even chatbots, these are actually applications that are driving significant industrial value. But I actually think the potential of creative machines has not been fully realized. And this is in part by them being locked inside the cloud. So where you come in is in defining what we want from creative machines. At least for now, we're still the architects of these systems. And we have the power to drive their development. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Just send me an email, and I promise to respond personally. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you by making you answer questions. Now, we can do this one of two ways. I can ask the questions. If you want to ask questions, you have to ask only one short one, and we'll make sure that each one of the three panelists gets a question. So, which way do you want to do it? Okay. Question. So, pretending the politicians aren't here, I would ask Natalie, does she see any current government incentives that perhaps uh, could be put through the filter she's suggesting for uh, better and more effective outcomes? Okay. Well, a tough question. So, <laughs> I'm actually quite new to Canada, but I think I can say a little bit about how I think governments can take cultural context into account when they do their work. And I think I have a few policy recommendations for governments. Of course, the first thing is to simply just think about the cultural context of where you're doing your work. And that might include going down and talking to people and doing focus groups. But another thing that can be very helpful, because people may not even know how their culture might affect their responses to different policies, is to induce policy experiments in different places. So you could imagine rolling out policies in a way that we can actually test the effects of different policies. So randomly varying different parts of policies, estimating their effects in different places, or randomizing the timing of when we roll out policies so we can actually get a sense of how a policy is working, and not just how it's working on average, but how it's working for different types of people. Very good. I'm gonna to turn to Gabriella and say, based on my deep level of ignorance of photosynthesis, I understand it's not that efficient. But it does generate sugar. Generates an energy source that we can store, getting around the storage mm -hmm. problem for electricity. So, double barreled question. How far do you think we are away from beating photosynthesis at efficiency in making a real fuel rather than just electricity? Um. So I think there are two approaches that we could take to beating photosynthesis to make fuel. Um, one is the entirely materials way, create kind of light harvesting I was talking about, add a catalyst to it. Um, and then the other is improving on photosynthesis, uh, creating improved algae that can do a much better job than current photosynthesis. Um, so I would say, kind of surprisingly, we're actually closer in this one than in this one here. Uh, so in terms Don't of... Don't tell Fed Sergeant. <laughs> but I, okay, I will preface that by saying I think climate change is a big enough issue that we need to move forward on all fronts as fast as possible. So we can't wait till we fail in one direction before exploring another. Ah, that's um, the better answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So does anybody want to ask the scary robot question? <laughs> Go ahead. Some of the economists and business professors that you know well at the Rotman School have been thinking a lot about the economic implications of, of artificial intelligence. And, and they characterize um, AI as dramatically dropping the cost of prediction. Uh, and you, know, you, can, you can think about it, you know, there's obvious things you could predict. But if you think about sort of creation, one way to think about it is more um, AI could predict what music people would like or what art they would like to, to uh, observe. I mean, is that, is that a way to sort of try to put, put um, creation in AI? I actually 
don't see it as, as I'm going to use a technical term, binary. I actually see it as a, as a continuum from prediction to creation. The specific example that you gave of, um, I'm going to use the word prediction here, predicting what kind of music or art someone would like, I would still cast that towards the end of the spectrum at the prediction end. Because, of, because the, the output itself is still, uh, could be enumerated. Um, it's, it's low dimensional. It's a, it's a choice. Um, so, that, and, the, and those types of services are ones that we're consuming right now. So I was trying to point towards maybe what's on, what's on the horizon, um, but I think these, recommend, we call them recommendation systems, they're getting better. I'm using them all the time. Many of us are using them, and they exist. I wouldn't go as far as to call them creation. When I say creation, I actually mean the, the system generates something high dimensional, like, like text or, or, or an image, or I, I showed you some examples of poetry and so forth. It, it's a continuum. So it's, uh, if, if you don't like the word um, creation, what we might, some, uh, another technical term for it is structured prediction. Emphasis, emphasis on the complexity of the output and the fact that it's uh, highly interrelated and, and, and correlated, as opposed to just a single scalar output. 10 past 9, I was to draw this to a close, so I think our host has final remarks, if I'm not mistaken. But I think we should start by thanking the three global scholars who've shown us just how wonderful these people are. Well, I hope everyone's enjoyed their evening. Um, I'm Barb Stymist, and I have the great honor of, of chairing this amazing board of this amazing institution. It's been a, a great evening for all of us to um, have a window on how some global scholars are thinking about some of the world's most important issues. I think the complexity of solving economic issues um, is uh, well illustrated by uh, Naomi's discussion around culture. I think that uh, you can't pick up a newspaper um, or a magazine without understanding or without certainly uh, reading something about AI and how it's evolving. In every discussion we have, we learn a little bit more. So um, today I learned about the difference between prediction and, uh, and cre creation, and I think that was, that was excellent. And then, of course, uh, one of the, the problems that I think we all worry about uh, leaving the world in better shape for our children and understanding how, uh, how we could learn from nature um, to solve our sustainability issues um, was fantastic to, uh, to really understand the work that's being done in the photosynthesis area. Uh, so thank you to Gabriella and thank you to Natalie and, and thank you to Graham, um, an amazing insights into everything you're doing. Uh, thank you to the Israeli uh, Foundation uh, for working as a great partner with us in uh, funding our global scholars. I think it's absolutely imperative for Canada to build its capacity, um, and it's great that Canada can fund and, and lead in developing global scholars, so not just Canadians, but it was also great to, to have someone from the, southern, the south side of the border. I think you all know how we work at CIFAR. I think many of you are veterans of our CIFAR events. Um, it's always fantastic to expand our brains and understand what's going on in the scientific community. And as Alan and I often discuss, really being at the nexus of, of understanding that the advancements in science and how advances in science can change the world for the better um, is what makes being a part of the CIFAR family so exciting. So I just wanted to end by thanking all of you for coming, um, and a very special thank you um, to our two ministers who are here, um, Minister Duncan and uh, Minister Moridi. Uh, great honor that you could join us today, and of course our, our Lieutenant Governor. Um, great to see you again, and, and thank you for your support of CIFAR. Enjoy your evening, and uh, see you next time at our next CIFAR event. Thanks so much.